the task force, our first meeting. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the task force. We're going to try to get a lot done in the next few months uh, to, uh, to develop some policy ideas and, and suggestions and potential options ahead of the 2021 session. I'm looking forward to serving with my co-chairman, uh, Michael Meredith. Um, we welcome you, and we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, remind folks, if you've got questions, to text either Chairman Meredith or me or Katie. Uh, if you're in the, if you're attending remotely and you've got a question and you can't find one of our numbers, which I know Katie has sent out, feel free to put that in the chat, and we'll that'll be flagged for us, and we'll ask. And of course, if you're here present in the room, feel free to just raise your hand like normal. Uh, with that. Uh, let's jump right in and have the roll call, please. Senator Nemus. Present. Senator Schickel. Senator Webb. Representative Petrie. Present remotely in the annex. Representative Rothenberg. Present in the room. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Brad Boyd. Present remotely. Cookie Cruz. Mary Noble. Chairman Westerfield. Chairman Meredith. Here in the room. Okay. All right. Remember to, uh, to text us your questions. Uh, with that, we're going to jump right in. Um, turn your cell phones off. And uh, if you're testifying before the committee, I'm reading this instruction. Please state your name and title for the record before you begin your testimony. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, always in front of a, a, a committee here in, in Kentucky. Uh, so with that, what's that? that that's right. Uh, if you need the materials, they're there. Uh, on your cell, uh, it could be on your cell phone, your iPad, your whatever. They're online, uh, so that's been uh, distributed. Give me just a second. All right, uh, we're gonna go. Uh, in a word of here, unless there's need to, to do otherwise, uh, Steve Shannon, Executive Director of the Kentucky Association of Regional Programs. Uh, come on up, Steve. Glad to have you here in person. And I know we've got uh, Jodan Beavers and uh, Eric Embry, the CEO of Life Skills and formerly the Penn Rural Mental Health Center, also attending remotely. Um, Mr. Shannon. Thank you. I think my mask off while I testify. Uh, you, you certainly may. Thank you. Did not do that Monday. Family report, you were muffled, which I think they were happy about. <laughs> uh, I am Steve Shannon. As I said, he's the executive director of CARP. CARP's the association of 11 of the 14 community mental health centers. There's 14 community mental health centers in Kentucky, serving all 120 counties. We've been in operation since 1966. Uh, we resolved the legislation passed by President Kennedy, signed into law October 31st, 1963. Actually, the last piece of legislation he signed before that fateful day in Dallas on November of 22nd. The system, and I always want to tell you about a little about mental health centers. We serve about 180,000 people annually. It's about 125, 26 Kentuckians access these services at a mental health center. Our enabling statute, KRS 210, we're a creature of the General Assembly, uh, clearly identifies serving people with intellectual development disability, people with mental illness, and people with substance abuse disorder. And we serve 180,000 distinct individuals annually. It's probably about 8,000 people annually, 8,000 people. Uh, about one at one, one point, that was one in 200 working Kentuckians was employed at a mental health center. Pretty economic force, really, statewide. And a piece that doesn't get talked about much, we we're led by 300 committed volunteer board members who really shape the future of services and what centers are doing. I tell people community mental health centers make communities better through exceptional services, good jobs, and committed volunteer leadership. And that's really what we do as mental health centers. That's the important piece. And that's kind of our background, okay? Today, I was asked to talk about mental health and incarceration. 
Uh, when I hear mental health, I expand that to include substance use disorder as well, because that's a pretty significant piece. And unfortunately, but probably not surprisingly, individual intellectual and developmental disabilities are crossing that path as well. They're having some legal problems, and those are raising up now in different places. I actually had a in this room on Monday talking about exceptional supports, and one of the characteristics for people with intellectual and disability who need additional supports are criminal justice involvement. So it's really happening, unfortunately. So for us, this is something we need to pay attention to and we are committed to doing. There's a PowerPoint in your packet. Um, I do better without PowerPoint. So I'm gonna speak, hopefully get everything covered. I have my cheat sheet in case I miss something. I'll check that to make sure I cover everything. I had cheat sheets in school, I would have done better. Uh, so this is what we're doing. And again, uh, the category is pretty broad. So we were starting, I was trying to figure out, what can we do? And I had a conversation with Joe Dan Beaver, who's the CEO of LifeSkills, and Eric Embry, the CEO of Pennyroyal, about how can we approach this topic, because it's a fairly large piece of waterfront. Um, so we said, let's look at it from a perspective of, of a continuum, in terms of an arrest, maybe pretrial, what happens there, uh, services while the person is incarcerated, and reentry. And in our world, I call it transition, because that's what we really talk about. It's reentry. What do we do? Uh, and I think that's, a, that's how I'm going to approach it. I'm going to talk about those things. Some things we have done, and some things that small problems that we're doing with two programs at the end that are pretty exceptional that we're going to talk about. But one theme, if I was told, what's the one thing that y'all need to take away today? And it's a pretty simple message, and it's across all healthcare. But in our focus today, all right, and this impacts uh, jail and corrections reform, is services accessed sooner. The sooner someone gets services, the better the outcome it is for that person. The sooner they get the services, the better the outcome. And secondarily, the sooner services are delivered to people, right, they get services, the better the outcome for the system, okay? So the individual, who I like to talk about, will get a better outcome if they access services sooner, right? Don't wait, get them as soon as possible. And the system is better that way. And the system is better that way. I used to talk about cost savings. I don't know if it's a savings, but it's a cost avoidance. I don't know if our budgets decrease significantly because of action, but there's not added people to the existing budget, so you can spread the resources better that way. You're not forced to do more things. So the system benefits us because they're not getting more expensive, more intensive services someplace else. So a theme is better services delivered sooner is better outcome. I really think that's true. If you look at dentistry, they tell you get your teeth cleaned twice a year, right? So you don't get a root canal. We accept that premise. Let's apply it here as well on mental health and substance abuse. So we talk about the continuum. And the very beginning of this process and the continuum is, is what can people do when there's a crisis for an individual in the community at that point? What can happen? And what the centers do in collaboration with local law enforcement is a program called crisis intervention training. And this is the first step. And again, this is services better sooner, okay? This program started in Memphis because Memphis had some bad encounters, unfortunate encounters, between people who were severely mentally ill, not taking their medication, and folks who, uh, and law enforcement officers. So they figured out what can we do. Yeah, you can't wear glasses and a mask, because everything fogs up, you know, bad enough. So anyway, <laughs> so you end up with that case. It was brought to Kentucky by a gentleman named Jim Bailey, who was the executive director of NAMI Kentucky. Uniquely qualified to bring this, Mr. Bailey was, because he had a child with a mental illness and a child who was police officer. He understood this world from both perspectives. But what this program does is train police officers in how to interact with someone who's mentally ill and got a problem. Maybe not taking their medication, get upset, you know. You probably heard stories train police officers to go and interact with that person, right? Trained in de-escalation, remain calm. Speak in a very, you know, slow, cautious way. Don't, 
aggravate the person, right? And do that. And the outcome is the individual police officer, and they take that skill, focus on mental illness, but applies to substance abuse and intellectual development disabilities, and they have a better interaction with that person, right? Bad things don't happen. Second thing is police officers aren't getting hurt in that transaction, in that interaction. Police officers were getting hurt before this training. The centers do that training, two, three days a week training. Some law enforcement, local agencies, everyone's been trained. Some have dedicated CIP officers. But the point is, the person is better served, the law enforcement officer is better equipped, isn't getting harmed. And instead of taking that person to jail, they may take that person to a crisis stabilization unit for mental health treatment, a psychiatric hospital. They're not showing up at jail. That's got to be a good deal for everybody. They're getting those services, law enforcement safety. One quick story, state police told me this. They got, both were trained. They showed up, a deputy sheriff showed up. They were in the class together. They expected when they got to this person's house that something bad was going to happen to somebody that day. And it didn't happen, <laughs> you know. Person. They were able to de-escalate the person, get them into treatment, and go on about their business. They didn't spend eight hours there, right? You know, no one got injured in the process. It worked really well. That CIT, it's an upstream. Is it Desmond Tutu who said we can pull people out of the river, but let's figure out why they're falling in the river upstream? CIT is an upstream te technique that works again for law enforcement and the person and gets them into services. Works for everybody involved. Pretty good thing. Another thing you've heard about are drug courts. Again, going down the continuum, drug courts the next step. These are individuals who've been arrested, right? They're facing some sort of incarceration, jail time, whatever, prison, whatever it's going to be. But they agree to participate in drug court, right? And the judge holds them accountable. Judges have that special power that case managers and clinicians don't have to hold, and family members, and sometimes individuals, to be held accountable. They have to participate in drug courts. The data is the model. It's all over the state, but it's never been a systematic process. Judges want to do it. AOC wants to support it. How is it paid for? How does that work out? If this is really effective, let's get as many drug courts as we can and specialized treatment. Again, to prevent a conversation of these folks being in jail in the focus of this task force. It's almost a management issue of what takes place with drug courts. Really effective. If you ever had a chance to go to drug court graduation, you ought to go to one. It's just a profound experience to have people who are now sober, they feel like they can manage their life and can move on to recovery, which is a whole different thing than being sober. So drug courts, related to drug courts, right? And we provide services. Drug courts have drug screening scenes, so we're checking to make sure. They're getting into treatment. They have to participate in treatment. They have to go. They can't skip out. Some communities have mental health courts, the same places. Lexington has one. Started in Lexington. You know, they figured out a way to pay for it, not a systematic approach. Other communities have those as well. Louisville one time had a veterans court because they had a lot of veterans who were having problems, focused on specific that issue. And again, <coughs> the goal is we're upriver, we're up the stream, we're not pulling bodies out, we're preventing bodies from getting in. So we have drug courts, mental health courts, veteran courts, we're working there. So that's the next step. Briefly, what are we doing in jails? Okay? Because that's the first step. What's happening in jails? We all have contracts with local jails. And CMHC is our regional model. I emphasize the regional model. From as few as five counties to as many as 17 counties. Their relationship across, within their county, within their region with local jails isn't the same. You know, it varies. Some is really, really good. Some is aspiring to be good. Different centers have different approaches to jails. So it's a local issue, jails are different perspective. I like the local perspective. I think that's how it drives the system better as opposed to top down. But one thing that started in Lexington at the Mental Health Center there, Bluegrass, now New Vista, was a jail triage program. And this was done in response to suicides in jails. All over the Herald Leader, maybe 15 years ago, several suicides over a short period of time. Bluegrass, now New Vista, developed a tool in collaboration with the jail. Clinicians did this, and the retired jailer on, so had the suicide prevention things they need to identify and the jail protocol they needed. This is a telephonic. Back in the day, this was cutting edge technology. Telephonic today, who still has a telephone, right? But it's that technology 
and it was a jailer could call, I have someone who's at risk of suicide, mentioned they want to hurt themselves, oh my gosh, I want to die, what has happened to me? They can call and get specific directions, protocols to follow. Person needs to be in an observation cell, needs to be seen every 15 minutes. That person's in crisis. You need to call the mental health center and get someone out there today to get them committed to a tier three. Call them right now. Bluegrass, train professionals 24-7. Not a cheap thing to do. Calling to a local mental health center. Who's on call, go to the jail, go see this person. It needs to happen. Again, the focus is keeping people safe. The better service sooner, the better outcome. It's not as soon as at arrest, right? They're in jail, but how can we keep people safe? Jail triage. Uh, mental health centers want to work with jails. I think we really want to do more of that. We need to figure that out. I think one thing that could come out of this task force or recommendation is encourage those relationships to get back and look at that. Uh, we did a planning initiative several, two years, 20 years ago, and one guy was mad he had to do it, CEO, since retired. Uh, unfunded mandate, why are you making me go into this? And he complained about it. Two months later, he said, it's a pretty good thing. We thought we had a good relationship with our local partners, and we didn't. And he was a big enough guy to acknowledge that. Thought we had a good relationship and we didn't. Maybe a recommendation is go back and have conversations with local jails. And local jails have conversations with mental health centers. Because maybe you think the relationship is good and effective and maybe it's not. Going from jails to corrections. This happened again maybe eight years ago and we're still doing this. Substance abuse outpatient treatment. Intensive outpatient treatment for people coming out of corrections. They get referred to us. They have to participate. Intensive outpatient treatment is three hours, maybe three, four days a week. So you get maybe 12 hours of therapy, supports, group therapy a week. They have to participate. This is an evidence-based practice. The outcomes for IOP is comparable to residential. You can do IOP and still work, right? You can still do IOP and you know, so you have the money to live and support yourself and go on from there. So that's a new program that's happening. And all the centers are participating in that with the Department of Corrections. Again, this is pulling a person out of the grid to work with you, getting them from there. So that's a brief overview of what we've done talking about. One piece before we go on to the two specific programs is the value of the Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is profound because prior to that, single males had no way to pay for substance abuse treatment. It just wasn't possible. At one point, I was told, if you're single male and you need treatment, you might as well be arrested because corrections will give you treatment. So the, subs the Medicaid expansion allowed that population, based on income, to access services, which allows them to go to out intensive outpatient treatment, allows programs to support people, right? And what they've done, and this happened in the prior administration, and it's been formalized, is instead of when you, if you're in prison or jail, you can't get Medicaid. They used to stop the Medicaid and you'd have to reapply. Now they suspend from the Medicaid and then they reactivate it upon discharge. So when you get out, it's activated again. One little anomaly, you gotta go to the DCBS office and tell them you're out of jail, and then you're back on Medicaid. That allows for these services to be paid. It's an invaluable change in accessing services for individuals who didn't have coverage before. State general fund dollars and mental health centers have been reduced. A lot, we used to have flexible dollars. A center could spend some flexible dollars on that piece, doesn't exist anymore, but Medicaid allows that to happen. And that's a pretty important piece. Two programs I'm gonna highlight, one in Northern Kentucky and one in the uh, Penny Royal Center in Hoffman. One in Northern Kentucky is with North Key. It is the Heroin Expedited Addiction Recovery Treatment, HART. I think they like the word HART and there's horse letters to fit that, but it's the HART program. And this is done with a Boone and Kenton County, okay? And it's done in their community. Judges, when someone gets arrested and they have an opioid, right? They're either tested positive or they have opioids on their body. That person, that judge, orders a substance abuse assessment. And that substance abuse assessment is sent directly to the mental health center there in North Key. They get it immediately. They go and do the assessment. It's an ordered assessment as opposed to ordering the assessment and not having someone do it right away. They do the assessment, make a recommendation back to the judge. Again, some people are recommended substance use intensive outpatient treatment. If that happens, that individual goes right into treatment immediately. They're not going to the jail, they're not being incarcerated, they get into treatment. They meet a case manager, 
in the world of services appeal of intellectual development disability, mental illness, and substance use disorders, case managers are the linchpin. Those are folks who connect them to access in the community, connect them to services, connect them to housing, connect them to jobs, and do these things. This program in fiscal year 20 did 776 assessments. Okay? And the goal is to get them into treatment, to get them into sober. They don't get arrested. They don't get to jail. They're not occupying that space in the jail. They're working and they're participating. 597 assessments in Kenton County, 179 in Boone County in fiscal year 20. And 20 had COVID in it. Still a lot of people impacted. So we're going to treatment instead of jail. Again, better services a little bit sooner is a better outcome. The next program I'm going to touch upon briefly is involves the Penny Royal Center, Hopkins, Little Surrounding Counties, and the Western Kentucky Correctional Facility and the Green River Correctional Facility. This is really what I call transition. So this is a release program. Penny Royal has a case manager again, that person dedicated, who is actually officed, housed at the facility. And they are identified people, sent their names of people who are, have an opiate use disorder, heroin, Oxycontin, or substance disorder, six months before their release date. And they work with that person for those six months before they're released and 90 days after. And the focus is to get that person connected to community-based services. If they're on Vivitrol, Vivitrol is a medication that blocks the uptake of heroin. So you don't experience the high. If they're taking Vivitrol, they get that in corrections, make sure they have someone who is a, a, a physician to prescribe with the Vivitrol, the injection every 28 days, that takes place. So that's not missed. That happens. If they need therapy, that's connected. Substance use services, that's connected. Make sure they're Medicaid eligible. Start looking for jobs, food stamps, so they can live in the community and be supported. The focus being that person hopefully doesn't go back to them. The recidivism rate's impacted by that person. Clearly, that's what happens. The data shows. Again, this was suspended because of COVID. The person can no longer go because you know, they're not a facility, so it's been suspended since the middle of March. But up to that point, Green River, which I understand is a maximum security facility, those folks are receptive to the supports. They had 49 appointments upon release, and 42 of those were cut. Pretty significant thing that they're connected to the community, and hopefully that stops, right? Hopefully that works. The other piece is at Western, the numbers aren't so good. And one staff there said it's a minimum security facility, not there for as long. They may feel connected to the community and don't want the services. But it's working at Green River. So what can we do the next step? One thing that's totally unrelated to this topic is a waiver for people who are severely mentally ill. And I say that because I think this is going to impact the number of people interacting who are severely mentally ill with the criminal justice system. A person has an intellectual development disability and they're in a waiver. If their medication is one hour late, that is a reportable event. One hour late. They're supposed to take medication at six, they get it at seven o'clock. That agency has to tell the Department of Behavioral Health medication will run out. If you're severely mentally ill, if you don't take your medication, no one knows. If you don't take it for two days, a week, family member law enforcement will be the next person to know. At a waiver serving this population, at a residential option, you would know immediately. And that person would be on their medication right away. They wouldn't be arrested. They wouldn't interface with law enforcement. They wouldn't be in our jails. This is a strategy that we can spend 30 cents on in a waiver and draw down federal dollars versus a dollar in jails and get no federal money for that shit in prison. That's a way upriver issue that we can impact the number of people that interact. I've talked about this with health and women in health and welfare. The cabinet's not opposed to it. I think that's an opportunity, something, again, that will impact who gets services. So we don't know for sure the outcome of Green River, how that will work. Heart support is clearly, the heart, the heart program is clearly affected in people in the community. We are doing things now. I don't know if we have a systematic approach to the interface with jails and prisons. I think that's another piece. So I think one, encourage that relationship. Is there a way to develop, maintain regional autonomy? That's what we want to do. 
but add some structure to those relationships going forward to impact the services. And work on coming out so we know specifically what people need when they come back. They don't necessarily have to have skills in place. And that hopefully reduces recidivism, manages the census, get people into treatment as opposed to incarceration and don't end up being here. Quick story out of, out of Owensboro. Person went to a mental health court. They had substance abuse as well. They were probably self-medicating. Okay, they went through, they graduated, they recognized as a standing participant of the outcome of services, better service delivered sooner, better outcome. They are now been sober for a year. They've purchased a vehicle. They are working. They're making restitution payments. They're recognized they live in sober housing. It's a eight person, six person in a home who are all in recovery as a leader. This person went from someone who was regularly involved with law enforcement in a local jail to now making restitution and not being involved. That's an outcome that's good for the person and good for the system as a whole. Thank you. Any questions? We do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going <coughs> to yield to Chairman Meredith for a handful of these guys. Thank you, Chairman. And Steve, thank you for being here today. You obviously know that Central Westerfield and I have had some immersive uh, Correct. training with your groups. Yes. Uh, served on Joe Dan's board for eight years mm -hmm. prior and during my time here in the legislature. But I, I've got a few questions, and the first one's going to be multi-stage and, and a little broad. The, the next couple or three will be more directed. Okay. Uh, Last fall, when I was preparing for some work on, on looking at jails at the local level, one of the, the data points that we found that was about 15% of men and 30% of women that were booked into jails have a serious mental health condition of some kind, and that was NAMI data at the time. Uh, do you know if that data is still fairly accurate, number one, would be the first question? Uh, yeah, NAMI's really good at that stuff. I think it's, you know, I don't okay. think it's changed significantly. There's nothing that would have happened since then to impact that number. And, and then expounding upon that, I think one of the big questions that I've, I've had is we know that best practices are always the community-based mm -hmm. delivery models. That's what we've tried to do over the years. And this is probably going to take some homework, so I'm going to give you a little homework on this one, I think, Steve. Of that 15% of men, 30% of women that are in jails right now, with a serious mental health condition, is there a way that we can find out which ones would respond in a percentage number, which ones would respond to a community-based program, which ones are those that need a more intensive inpatient, institutionalized help to, to get back to uh, on their feet or, or to be dealt with in a more positive manner than they are in the jails currently? Um. I think from a broad perspective, yes. I think specific cases, it becomes more difficult. Talk to the person, see what works. But yeah, there's our community-based services. I think if you go back to my reference to a waiver, some of these folks could get a residential model, live in a home with two other people, that's staffed 24-7. It's less expensive. It's supported. You know exactly what they're doing. And really, if you have that model, maybe a year and 18 months out, they move into their own apartment because they're doing better, right, and get those supports. I think there's some folks who will need more long-term supports, maybe, you know. Some folks need to spend maybe more time getting that intensive support. But I think if you figure out a way, because what happens now, there's not a place for folks to go and live and get the 24-7. There's personal care homes, and they do a great job, but it's not. It's larger numbers. It's not the same deal. It's, it's less supervision. You come and go. So I think that's a piece that will address that problem and decrease what happened from that. I also think, what were they doing beforehand? And can we learn from what they were getting and why didn't that work and what can they come and do? There's a day program operated by Mental Health Centers, Therapeutic Rehabilitation Program. It's, it's <coughs> you know, eight to two. You know, it's still going on now. We're doing our best to hold it together in COVID. But that takes place. That's an opportunity as well. That's a structure setting where they don't see. Part of what we have to be cautious of is our friends in the managed care world, if they see a service that looks like it's it's kind of judiciary, judiciarily necessary as opposed to medically necessary, they may not see it as their issue. 
is this really a judicial piece, a criminal justice piece? Therefore, we don't pay for that because we pay for medical care. If you looked at pieces of legislation that related to this field the last, well, since 14, when they showed up, 11 when they showed up, there's a paragraph added that the same standard will be applied. The same standard of care as applied to medical necessaries will be provided in cases involving criminal justice care. We added that language to prevent that. We had some problem with that, but added that language. But I think that's the piece, is what do we need? And we don't have that residential option in place. And that's really the ticket, in my opinion. And you have led me into the third phase of that first question. If we were to get some kind of a waiver solution like you're talking about, mm -hmm. how many residential allotments would be available, number one, or how, how quickly could we get enough of those to be able to provide for the population that would we, we would be serving at that point in time? Uh, waivers, you participate in the crafting of the waiver with CMS, the federal <coughs> level, because really they oversee it. Four states have waivers for people with mental illness already, so they exist, okay? The, Kentucky would decide what that number needs to look like and what's the eligible population. The SCL waiver, I think now it's about 3,000 people, but 2,700 waiting. The Shell P waiver, doesn't have a residential option, is 10,500 people waiting, right? There's a lot of people out there who's really mentally ill. You can define the category of who's going to be eligible, okay? I really think a waiver is a vehicle because, again, it's 30 cents, not a dollar. It's in the community. It's getting support services in the community. Okay. Now, if I could go down. These are more directed and specific questions. I know one of the things that I hear, and this is not a problem everywhere, Steve, but especially in rural communities, small rural areas with crisis intervention, um, the training is great, the, the, the idea is wonderful, but those times when a law enforcement officer in one of those small rural communities, whether it be city or county, mm -hmm. sheriff's department or police department, encounter someone and they have to go through that crisis intervention process, they need to be assessed by a community mental health center, need to be taken on to the maybe the, the institutional facility, whatever the situation may be in that. Many times, those communities only have one officer on the streets for a given time. And based on the regional nature of everything, sometimes that's a real challenge because it might take that one officer yeah. that's patrolling the streets out of that community for three or four hours at a time, and there's no coverage there at that right. point unless you know there's a call-in situation. Yeah. And that's the 202A, that's the involuntary commitment process. That, that, and you know, the statute says, I don't know if it says local sheriff, but it says law enforcement will provide transportation. Um, I don't know if you know Kelly Gunning. She's an advocate, has a son with mental illness. Uh, Faye Morton, there's Tim's Law. Faye Morton's son, Tim, was taken off in patrol car 44 times for Eastern Star Hospital. Right? They will tell you, why are we using a patrol car? Right? Why are we using that if you get put in the back of a cruiser, right, with handcuffs? Why is that happening to someone who's mentally ill? So I agree, right? That's what and I think that was done because that exists. But we've had the same story. I've heard similar stories where people are held in local police office, you know, for six hours because there's no one available to transport. How do you make that happen? I think we got to figure out some conversation. And this is a conversation for the Department of Behavioral Health, right? What's the alternative transportation method? What else can we do? Um, you know, people say ambulances, right? Ambulances aren't necessarily, you know, they're not anymore you know, available. But that's the place. So, you know, in, in your community, they go to Western State Hop Hospital. They got to get assessed by someone at Life Skills. Then they go on and, you know, they get to Western State Hospital and they're sitting there and waiting there at Western Hill. We've heard this repeatedly. I understand it. Why is it law enforcement's deal to change? I'm not criticizing oh, when no, I say no. that. I, I'm, I'm, I think this is something that we should put on our radar as yes, this process moves so. forward. Because you know. perfect example you mentioned, if you take my community of Brownsville, yeah. it's a 30-minute drive to Bowling Green to start the assessment at Life Skills. You've got an hour then on to... Western State, 
from Bowling Green, you're already at three hours round trip with no waiting. And you haven't done the assessment yet. Correct. Got to do the assessment. No, no, I'm, I'm with you 100%. So I'm just saying I think that's something that we all should be thinking about as we move through this process. And if you all can provide suggestions to us, I think that's something that could also be brought into this discussion. Um, So that's somewhat rhetorical, I guess, in nature. No, I think it needs to be discussed, and this is a good venue to do that. I think the beauty of it, you know, I didn't help craft 202A. No one here helped craft 202A. So let's figure out if there's a better way to figure out to get people who need to be involuntarily committed. We acknowledge that level of care is necessary for some people. What's a better way to get them there? Um, With regard to the expansion and substance abuse, are we getting a best practice amount of substance abuse treatment for folks, or are they on a shorter track with that Medicaid piece than what a best practice would be? Um, I don't think they're on a shorter track of the Medicaid. Okay. Medicaid pays uh, intensive outpatient, you know. Uh, now, what does happen, some of those services are prior authorized with our friends at the MCOs, and they could say no more. I bet some residential programs get denied. There's the American Society of Addiction Medicine, it's ASAM, and they actually have language about uh, not always recommending residential. Some, you know, and the guy that wrote that really was addressed in some courts and some places you know, a teenager who gets possession of marijuana first offense is getting six months residential. That's not necessarily at that point, right? So that wasn't, that's what that relates to. But I think that's the piece. Residential has been impacted. So the people who need residential may not be getting it. Tens of outpatients, some prior offs are denied. So people don't get as long as we can. But that's a function of, of, of the managed care environment. Is that not consistent domestic. with all the MCOs or one or two in particular? Um, I hear the most denial of, of prior authorization. I hear mostly about one. Well, there's others. It happens in different populations at different times. But there's one in particular who, if someone is referred to residential from drug court, they may not approve that service. And the person's already there, you know. And then my final last last one, and then we'll move on to anybody else. Uh, you mentioned the, the interfacing with folks while they're in jail or mm-hmm. prison. Uh, through the community mental health centers Mm -hmm. right now. I would think that that would promote some kind of a challenge from time to time when you've got somebody that is not incarcerated in their home area and as they transition back into uh, and out of that population Mm -hmm. back into the normal population, is there a challenge occurring now transferring their, their care and their help that they're getting in the prisoner jail population back to that home area yes. because of the regional nature. Is that yeah. an issue there? And there's not always a great handoff, right? The Green River, that person, that 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 case manager, if if I'm at that facility, whatever that's at, in that part of the state, and I'm going back to Maysville, they call the mental health center in Maysville. They make that connection for the person. There needs to be an intentional linkage going back. And I think that has addressed some of those things. And we as a mental health center have to be responsive to that intensive language. I mean, we have to know, we have to dedicate, identify who is the staff person you're going to contact and what's going to take place. When COVID happened, a lot of folks got released from from facilities because of COVID, and we provided a list of names. Now, there was no mechanism, there's no real way, but that's what I think that would make the relationship stronger and better and go from there. So there's specific, and it really is an intentionality got to make sure this is happening. We know what's going on. We struggle with this from psych hospitals. People get released from Western State, Eastern State, wherever, and we don't always know what's taking place. We need to do it. That's a piece that's on us, and we got to partner with our, with our friends at Corrections to make sure. It's a great point. Thank you, Steve. You've done your homework, sir. Appreciate the, the indulgence for the many questions, Co-Chair. Uh, the chairman's prerogative. Uh, you, you ask all you want. Um, I'm going to read this question that I got by text, and I don't know from whom this question came, uh, but they sent this, so I'm going to read it verbatim. Will you ask, and here I am asking, if the program such as HEART would be successful if it was expanded to drugs besides opioids? Is there a reason that these programs are opioid specific? There are changes in trends constantly and a rise in use of meth and various other drugs. Do you think that expanding these programs to serve folks with substance use disorder despite the type of substance that are dependent uh, will help more people? Yes. Yeah, and, and that program started because Northern Kentucky, Senator Schickler, I mean, obviously you were there, right? 
opioids was a huge issue there two, three, and still persists. So that was the focus of the issue at the time they were addressing was opioids, is why that was targeted for opioids. But yeah, intensive outpatient treatment can work with other populations, other drugs. It's just so it's not tied back. At the time, that was number one. Now what's happening, and I hate this phrase, meth is making a comeback. I like to play golf. Tiger Woods is making a comeback. I don't, no one was sad meth was gone. But, you know, meth is becoming, so meth is returning. It's becoming prevalent as a thing now. So it would work there as well. Yeah. When I hear of drugs that are trending back up, all I, all I acknowledge or all I hear is that the, the force of addiction is still out there. Correct. And drug People dealers. are just finding another yeah. avenue to, to. I mean, supply and demand. Yeah. You know, they're going to sell something else. Uh, I'm going to call on Senator Schickel next. But before I do, I want to comment. I've, I think I've mentioned this to you. I know I've mentioned it to Joe Dan and to Eric. Uh, and I've shared it with Katie before. I don't know if I've shared it with Chairman Meredith. There's a group that I was asked to do some uh, video work for out of Nashville, and it's the it's the life skills of the Penroll Center of Middle Tennessee, the uh, mental health co-op. Mm -hmm. And they've got, or just opened in the last year or so, they were constructing it at the time, but what they called the Crisis Treatment Center. Yep. And it serves essentially the middle third of, of mm -hmm. Tennessee. Um, and I yeah. can't, it doesn't solve the the very real problem of, of distance uh, and for communities like Brownsville heading to Bowling right. Green in 30 minutes is not as bad as it could be. Right. Tompkinsville is also served by Bowling Green right. and that's a little bit more than 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got, well, it doesn't solve that problem but the whole thing is premised on and they and they work with law enforcement to build this, this mechanism and it's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year and it it, it's very intentional to make the time commitment for the police officer to do that warm handoff mm -hmm. for someone that needs care to be 10 minutes or less. Yeah. They don't have to stay there and do a bunch right. of other and wait. Once they've, they've gotten that person, and it really is aimed at doing what you started your presentation with, getting that person plugged into treatment and, and behavioral health care as soon as possible. Uh, there's a similar program in Texas, and I swear I cannot remember if it's in San Antonio it's or It's in Austin. San Antonio. Thank you. And I've toured that one. Uh, I had been to it, couldn't remember which city it was in, uh, but it, it's wildly successful yeah. in both cases. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. I wish it was something that we could do uh, across Kentucky. Louisville, Center Can Seven County started the living room, similar model, 24-7 drop-off. There was not sufficient funding. I think they've had to scale back and look at it. But they were the same deal with law enforcement. Drop off, see someone right away. Uh, there's been conversation lexing around this issue. At one point, uh, they tried it at Eastern State Hospital, had a similar, not quite the same thing. Uh, but for, uh, they made law enforcement available. They had Wi-Fi computers. They could do paperwork right. when they're waiting, things like that. But I like that center room. Years ago, uh, the Mental Health Center in Paducah, Four Rivers, their 202A process, they had a dedicated person there 24-7, police would know, and they would guarantee the officer half an hour turnaround and would make a recommendation. QMHP in residence. Anyway. Senator Schickel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, uh, it, it is good to see you um, here. And uh, you've talked about um, a whole lot of things here in your presentation, all of them very important, and a lot of them really kind of overlapping into this area or that area. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, before I um, uh, came to this meeting at last week, I went and visited my local jail and sat down and talked to my jailer, and he was interested in this task force, and uh, a guy I've known for a long, long time, and uh, he said, I asked him, I said, what, what's your biggest challenge in the jail? And uh, what you're talking about, mental health, was the first thing he mentioned. So I think it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, that you have this first on the agenda because I think it's a uh, huge, huge issue. Um, you know, there's a song by Joan Baez, uh, a war protester folk singer that I like to listen to, and uh, she sings a song about somebody died in jail over a fight of a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is so symbolistic of mental health problems in jail because that glass of milk isn't about milk at all. It, mm -hmm. it represents um, all the baggage that people who come to jail uh, br bring with them. Um, so I'm happy to hear, uh, I, I guess I want to say one of the things I look forward to most about this task force is improving 
hopefully improving the relationships and the interaction between our local mental health facilities and our jails because uh, let's face it uh, we have both of them uh, we have p good personnel in both of them but sometimes as you say the handoff Mm -hmm. uh, isn't what it should be, and, and also the services in those jails. So uh, I look forward to working on that. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, the other thing is a follow-up just from what uh, uh, Chairman Meredith said, and I think he's exactly right. Uh, I think it was at 202A on, mm -hmm. the, trans on the commitments. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a long time since I dealt with those, but um, he's exactly right on that. And um, what happens when, when that, you know, People always, and we don't hear about this, but what happens in these small towns and rural areas is people, when, when, uh, when this happens, then they look for an alternative. And, and, and you never hear about the alternative, but many times the alternative is drop the person off at a bus stop, drive them to the next county, all these horrible alternatives that from a practical sense sometimes happen because people can't be tied up all day um, um, with these. So, I'm, so I do think what Chair, Chairman Meredith talked about, we do, this is something we need to look at because many times these are the worst cases. And, uh, and, and, and I think because of that, we, we have good intentions, but because it's so cumbersome, sometimes we have horrible outcomes because we don't hear many times of what really happens in the practical world with those people. Right. Thank you very much. Talked about two hundred and two A transportation for many years. Time to do something. Uh, for those that had uh, Joan Baez reference from Senator Schickel on your bingo cards, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> um, wouldn't did not didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm partial to Tony Mitchell, but it's all right. Um, I want to, in reference to what Senator Schickel just mentioned, I, I got a text here from Eric Embry. Uh, who mentioned one of the issues um, that they run into is it's on referral. So when the when the region, the individual is transitioning to doesn't have a needed service, that becomes a problem. The mm -hmm. Medicaid-assisted treatment is one of those that yeah. they've uh, run into that issue with. Uh, so another area where we need to, to address and making sure that the handoff is as warm as can be as possible. Yeah. Uh, at one point in my life, I worked down at Oakwood in the Fletcher administration. We had a document that had like a 127 data points for transition from Oakwood to the facility for people in Lake Norman. And I said, maybe we don't need 127, but we need more than this person's going to Mayfield. Right. Got to land. I agree. completely agree with that. Senator Nemeth. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this is a great start, and you've uh, brought up a plethora of things that need to be done and talked about. Uh, the courts, specific courts to address specific mm -hmm. things. I was in Lexington, and they had a child support yeah. court that helped keep uh, people out of prison and out of jails. Um, you brought up uh, the intervention, and um, I know in the outlying areas, like uh, Chairman Meredith was talking about, it is a, pr is a problem. We had discussed one time about the police officer dropping them at the jails and letting the jailer wait before they book them for someone to come and, and do the intervention. But you run into legal problems with that because the officer needs to book them when he goes to jail. So, mm -hmm. but those are things that do need to be discussed and, and worked yeah. on. Uh, maybe there's someone like addiction recovery centers mm -hmm. were um, uh, capable of coming to the jail mm -hmm. before they're booked and taking care of them so the officer could leave right. when they arrived. Um, another thing we worked on a lot with uh, when I was in the cabinet was a wraparound services, mm -hmm. specifically jobs. Yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. that uh, will stop the recidivism in that. So uh, I don't really have any particular question for yeah, you. Just wanted to thank stuff. you for being here and thank the chairman yeah. for a, a good start with. There's so many things, and a lot of times it boils down to money and uh, location because mm -hmm. what you can do in Lexington and Louisville and Northern Kentucky, it's hard to do out in the state. Yeah, so, but we still need to figure out how to make it happen. And she'll get access to those services. And that's that's why we're here to try. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah. And I think one thing that I think would be interesting to talk about is recovery. Uh, there's people who are now sober, and they're in recovery. But their life is really hard. You think their life is good. Uh, their finances are probably ruined. They've bounced checks all over the place. They have a long history of, of you know, do a background check, you know, with the state police on them. It's volumes long. 
Uh, they probably burned every bridge with their family, perhaps. Their network isn't there. There's an agency in Lexington who's focusing on recovery. And what do you need to get back? You know, and really, well, that's you get your to work? wraparound services yeah. with a with a job, with uh, where to go, yeah. where not to go, uh, how to, how do you live your life? And and you just different uh, peer group too. Partly, all your friends are still using probably. Yes, I mean really, yes. you got to go somewhere else. And uh, you mentioned also uh, six months before you get out of jail to wean them into regular life. And a lot of that might take legislation on yeah. uh, on that too. So yeah. thank you. A lot of work. Representative Taggart Lambert. Thank you for your for being here today. I was I really appreciate being on this being appointed to this task force because some of you may know that in my district um, we have just hired a warden and we're starting the hiring and training process for the uh, Southeast State Correctional mm -hmm. Facility. Um, so hopefully in the fall, we'll, we'll see those wheels turning toward the fall. Um, so a lot of my questions have been answered and a lot of those questions, um, but, but I still want to ask a question and, and I'll definitely, uh, in, in the uh, uh, minding of time, of course, um, I'd like to know uh, what is available for the uh, for a person who is incarcerated. What is a day in the life of the treatment that's available to them while they're incarcerated? Because you know, if, if there's some sort of hurdle that that we can maybe uh, you know uh, knock down in order to make sure that these folks get the treatment they 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 need while they're incarcerated. So whether it be to, to put them on the path to recovery right. or whether it be to integrate them into our workforce once they leave right. incarceration, is there something while they're incarcerated? Well, and I think corrections would be better prepared to answer that than I am. Okay. But they do have, within corrections, a division of mental health and substance abuse. Okay. So they have a cadre of, of licensed clinical professionals that work at their facilities. So they have that, and maybe that's a better question for them, you know. Okay. But they're doing that. They're they're probably doing group therapy, doing IOP. I know they're doing Vivitrol. Uh, so when people come out, they're on Vivitrol again. That prevents the uptake of, of the active ingredient in heroin or opioids. Uh, alcohol as well works on alcohol as well. And go on from there. So they have that mechanism, but they're probably better to give you the details than I would be. But so your services primarily, obviously, are involved in the uh, you know once they. Correct. Come we out are of community the, mental health. Right. And, right. and But still, your connection with those services yes, yes. that they received while they were incarcerated are very important. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so and, I, and I just thought maybe there was off. a connection yeah. that you there could There needs to be a handoff. On. So what was taking exactly. place there? You know, your part of the world is Mountain Comp Care. That's right. the mental health center. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, figure out how to make those things. So they're getting group therapy or they're getting IOP or this mm -hmm. is where they're at. This is the drug of choice before they went in. We know that information. The more we know upon leaving, the better the system of care can meet that person's needs. So I think that's an important piece. Okay. Thank you. Real and, transition. And most of my other questions have already been asked and answered, so thank you very much. I think you need a mental health person on the task force, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> I report to board of directors to give me intense supervision uh, one day a month. After that, I'm free. As long as it's six feet away. Steve, I appreciate it. I appreciate the work of CARB. Uh, and as Chairman Meredith mentioned, we both have a special relationship with Penrose Center and life skills, respectively. And uh, my dad, having been the executive director mm -hmm. of Penrose Center for a time, um, uh, it, we're very familiar with the services they provide. But this is clearly an area where there needs to be more cooperation. You and I had a conversation last October, November. Uh, about something that Chairman Petrie and I were, were discussing, uh, working on, uh, and the capacity's there to take advantage of, mm -hmm. uh, and there's certainly a population of people that need that care. Mm -hmm. There yeah. needs to be, we need to find a way to make the two meet. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you for starting us off well. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Yes, sir. Can I go home? You I may. Disagree. Thank you. You may. All right. Jailer Woosley? Yes, sir. You're up if you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, first off, I'd like to say uh, in regards to the last topic that uh, things have come a long ways in the 19 years that I've been um, involved in corrections on the mental health side. And 
we're heading in the right direction, although I agree we have uh, lots of topics to continue to work on. Uh, I'm Jason Woosley, the Grayson County Jailer. I'm here today to talk about the inmate phone system. Um, started my career in 2001 as a deputy jailer, and I became appointed jailer in 2014 and in turn uh, elected jailer in 2014 in the fall. So uh, in that 19 years, I've seen a lot of change um, in the jail system entirely, but uh, specifically today, we're talking about the phone systems. We started out um, when I came with an analog system that uh, we used three millimeter cassette tapes to record the phone conversations and we had about a 30 day supply of recordings. And today we're uh, all digital and uh, cloud storage and we can get as long as six to seven to eight years of storage in sometimes in some cases. So we've came a long ways. Um, the way the system works is when someone is booked into our facility particularly, um, they're assigned an account number and once they get into a uh, population where uh, the phones are located in each dorm, uh, the first phone call they make, it's an identity process where they have to state their name, uh, it records their voice, it has a voice identification system also, and then they have to create their, create their own private PIN number. So each time they use the phone after that, they have to put that PIN number in. The system uh, is supposed to recognize their voice, and then they can make a phone call after that. So those recordings are kept for, in our um, facility, about six years. Um, it depends on um, the use of the system. Of course, if the, if the demand's higher, that could be lower at times. Um, those recordings are um, widely used not just by the jails as an investigative tool, but also as uh, an investigative tool by prosecutors. And they have become a great tool. Uh, as you all know, nobody likes to admit it, but we have bad deputies from time to time. And those phones are, are a very good tool, especially in those circumstances that we can weed out bad employees. Um, on the good side, it's a, it's a point of contact for the inmates to have uh, basically constant contact with their families. Our facility does turn the phones off at about 11 o'clock in the morning, and they don't get turned back on until after the last one leaves the facility in the morning, which right now with COVID going on, they're on pretty much 24-7 because we're not doing um, much transporting at all. So they can also be used as a um, disciplinary tool if you have that are um, acting badly or uh, have been disruptive, then um, you can restrict it to what the law allows it to restrict it to. Um, with one phone call a week, we usually don't do that in our facility unless it's someone that's in disciplinary isolation uh, and they have been disruptive while they've been in that isolation time. So there's positives and negatives for the system itself. Today we're looking at, uh, a lot of people are looking towards um, using those same systems for video visitation, which is a hot topic right now. Uh, there's positives and negatives to those systems as well. Um, I, I like in-person visitation myself because I believe it's part of the rehabilitation of those inmates to have that contact with their family, especially with their local inmates. As most of you all know, we specialize in housing federal inmates, and some of those inmates are three to four hours away from home, and the family just won't visit. So video visitation would be a plus in those settings. Um, we have not the video visitation yet, uh, but there are a lot of jails that have. Um, it's difficult to control. Uh, some of the vendors will tell you that um, they can they can control the face, facial recognition so that you can't see anything in the background, but most of those are not, those systems are not very good. So you can't control what happens in the background. Um, you basically have to assign a deputy uh, on those 
visiting days or video visitation days to monitor that system uh, constantly, which is an expense to the jails. Also, a positive on um, both ends, the video visitation homes themselves, is there is some revenue created, uh, which most jails in the state can um, definitely use that revenue. Um, most jails are financially strapped, as well as their respective fiscal courts. So that's also a positive, although it's not normally a make or break amount of money that, that's going to make a tremendous impact on the facility itself. Um, the, the systems have been in place for years and they, they are a great tool for sure. Um, like I said, they, they can be negatives. The, our, our prosecutors and our sheriff's department and our local police department uh, are on the phone with us almost daily asking for recordings and um, doing investigative, using them for investigative tools to uh, help their prosecution. And in some cases, we've used those, um, or they have used those to uh, resolve cases that didn't, really didn't have anything to do with the inmate they were listening to, but that particular inmate just happened to be talking about an unsolved case here in the county that uh, they had a little information on. Uh, the inmates did comfortable, even though the recording on the phone system in the beginning of the call tells you that it's recorded. Uh, after a while, they're comfortable and they... Uh, They'll talk more than what you think they normally would. Have any questions so far? I, I do. Um, let me switch back to my other app here. Um, do you know how many counties are using uh, a similar phone system around the state? Or how many jails? I do not. Chairman, I, there are two major vendors out there. Um, That's going to be another question. Than, yeah, there's more than two vendors, but there's two major vendors in Kentucky. Um, and who most are of they? the jails. I'm sorry. Do you know who? Can you name what they are? What their names are? Uh, one of the two that I'm familiar with is Securus, and the other one is Combined Public Communication. What is the cost? What's the cost, the cost to Grayson County Jail for that system? The equipment is provided by the phone provider, and um, there is no cost to the Grayson County Jail, and we receive a commission from the use of those phones. What is the commission? That part of it is negotiable. Um, it's in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent for us. Uh, it's, I think it's 60% for us uh, without pulling the contract out and reading it. Um, so the numbers fluctuate. It's hard to use our facility as a um, comparison point because of our federal population. Most of our federal inmates have um, cash on hand or money on hand. Uh, some of the guys here actually have more money in their um, inmate account than I have in my personal checking account. So uh, the number for us is a little on the larger end. Uh, it can be anywhere from thirty to forty-five thousand dollars a month. Well, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the annual cost is, not just for the jail. And obviously, you're you're saying it's zero. And do both vendors operate on a commission type basis? That way, they give you the equipment for free. Uh, but you get a cut of what it costs for the inmate to make the call? As far as I know, yes, that's correct for both vendors. I'm trying to get an idea of what it costs for the inmates because I'll tell you that the opposite is true based on feedback I've heard from constituents uh, who have not been able to take advantage of phone calls because it's prohibited. The cost is prohibited. They can't afford to make calls or they're, you know, they're, uh, loved ones put money on on their account to use, and they're able to make calls, but it only goes so far. And twenty dollars for it's like it's like we're in nineteen eighty nine again, and it's you got to have a calling card, and it costs a fortune to call your mother. Um, when, as you mentioned, she's local, uh, and I yeah. I don't understand what the what I want to know, uh, Jason, is 
what the heck are we paying for? What are those inmates paying for? I mean, there, there's storage of those conversations. I mean, you, you mentioned that there are seven or eight years of worth of storage, six to eight years worth of storage back that, that you might need. Well, how far back have you ever needed to pull a conversation and a, a record of one? Um, and is it necessary to record that long a time uh, worth of conversations of folks? Um, and, you know, the online storage shouldn't cost that much. Uh, and it's getting cheaper. It's cheaper today than it was a month ago. Uh, so I, I'm yeah. trying to understand why it's so friggin' expensive. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, the rate is set by or regulated by the FCC. I think it's 21 cents a minute is the cap. Um, I think the vendor that we have right now is uh, charging 20 cents a minute. But something we Not see, we hear those same, Yeah, we hear those same complaints, and uh, what we see is, you know, the, the inmates will call the family member and say, you know, basically beg for money, and I'm I'm just barely making it, and I want to talk to my kids and whatnot. And so the family member will load money, and then those inmates will use that money to purchase commissary items instead of use phone time. Can't uh, we we limit see that, that a lot. Can't, can't we limit that? Uh, how hard well, would it what, be to restrict the use of those funds for the phone and the phone only? Yeah, well, so what has come into play in the last couple of years is the, with um, systems improving is the, the phone companies have put in place that family members can load phone time only so that the inmate has no choice in using it for anything except phone time. So, and, and that, with that said, uh, most of you guys know that we, um, we charge housing, any jail in the state does, uh, to their county inmates. So, um, most of them are about $10 a day. So, we can collect half of any money that comes in through their commissary account. But when it's restricted to phone time, then we can't touch that money either. So, there's two sides to that on the savings end. Do you know how much, uh, well, do you have any idea of how much money is, if only for your county, if not for the rest of the state, do you have an idea of how much money has been added to their their accounts that was phone money but was used for other things? Do you have any, any kind of information on that? Yeah, I don't have the number that, is used for other things, but I do have, I did run yesterday in preparing for this, the number that was loaded for just phone time uh, that is currently setting um, basically on hold until it's used at this facility is $89,687.02. But again, it's hard to compare us to anyone else because of our uh, federal population. One of our inmates has 15000 plus in his inmate account. So with that access to that much money, it's, you know, they're going to spend it. But can they already set it aside for just phone use? Yeah, they can do the same. They can log okay. on to their system and they can set uh, money okay. aside for just phone. Does the system that you use, or does the other vendor, do they allow um, uh, risk? You know, if I go out and buy one day, not anytime soon, when our daughter's old enough, you know, 25 or so, and I buy her a cell phone, uh, I can <laughs> I think I can restrict that phone uh, to you to call only certain numbers. Is that sort of feature available on these systems so that the people that have asked for or have gotten money, you know, they can call their attorney? They can call their family, they can call their doctor, they can call whomever, but can't call a bunch of other stuff. Those, are those restrictions available? Uh, yes and no. Um, there are available with the system that we have uh, capabilities available that we can block certain numbers, but we would have to have the knowledge of those numbers to block those numbers. Um, the, the, I'm not aware that the inmate can do any of that themselves uh, from can't you phone make them re Can't you make them report those numbers and who they are? And then you can... We can't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that happens. We have... You don't really see it on the money side as 
far as mom doesn't want the son to spend all of his money on uh, junk food. But where we do see that happen a lot is uh, Joe Blow comes to jail and he's got a uh, EPO against uh, his girlfriend or, or ex-wife or whatever, and that person will call in and say, block my number, please, I don't want them calling me. Or a law enforcement or prosecutor might call and say they're not supposed to have any contact. Can you add this number uh, as a block so that they can't make that contact? What protections are in place to make sure conversations with counsel aren't recorded? Um, that was a hot topic this past year and, and maybe a little bit the year before. Um, the DPA's office has um, given a list of numbers to, I think, all the vendors uh, to put in the system. I know the vendor that we use uh, actually put those numbers in. We did it to ourselves, so there was over a thousand numbers. And um, the vendor also made them uh, free of charge. So the, that was going to be my next question, pretty, whether or not calls to counsel uh, also had that yeah. same charge. So in the system we use, the, the recording that comes up, when you answer the phone, there's a recording that says you're receiving a call from Grace County Detention Center. And in that recording, it, it tells them that if you're an attorney and you don't want this call recorded, then they have, it, it gives them the option to call in and make their uh, phone number unrecorded. So the attorney has to make contact outside of the DPA office. Sorry to interrupt, but I assume that's that's if their number isn't already in the system as a recognized do not record number. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So we, on, uh, in addition to that, we we sent out emails to uh, all of the attorneys that we have contact contact with um, daily, and made sure that they were all aware of of, of that issue. Senator so. Webb just sent me a text and, and asked about private counsel, so I appreciate that. It may it may behoove. Uh, the, the jails that are using such a system to communicate with each county's bar association, each organ, or each area's bar association, to make sure private counsel is informed as well as uh, DPA Absolutely. counsel. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Schickel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you've uh, covered a lot, a lot of territory here. You and the uh, and Jason, uh, a lot of detail. Um, first of all, Jason, uh, you know. Thank you for everything you've done for jails statewide. I, are you president of the association or former president? No, I'm, I'm not either one. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah. well, boy, with the influence you had, I thought you were one of the. Uh, uh, but uh, thank you for everything you've done because you, you know, the Grayson County Jail is just one example, and there's probably a dozen other examples of jails across the Commonwealth of Kentucky where great things are happening. They're financially self sufficient. We have very professional, a, a lot of professionalism, and we read so much negative about jails. And you know, I, I love to tell the story because so many people aren't aware Kentucky's the only place in the world, and this might be good, it might be bad, depending on your perspective. Where we elect jailers, there's no place else in the world that does that. Uh, so we we definitely have a very unique a unique uh, system. But there's just kind of two things I want to say, because I think it covers all the conversation that you and Chairman Westerfield has had, is, is number one, newsflash, inmates will lie and exaggerate about what happens um, as far as their restrictions and how much phone services cost. But also, newsflash, jails will take advantage if given the opportunity, because they can, of a population who's captive and um, uh, um, really wants to make phone calls. So somewhere in the middle, uh, we we ha we do we have to look at this and make sure that those two things are not happening. Um, one of the things we have to remember about phone calls is, as I can remember the days, you know, since an inmate is only has to have two phone calls per week. I can remember the days when you stuck a phone in a cell, you dialed the number, and, and that was all the phone privileges an inmate had. Today, they have virtually 24-7 access to a phone, so an inmate that doesn't have financial resources is looking at an inmate that does have financial resources making all these phone calls, and, and that's what they're comparing it to when they're actually getting more, you know, as much or more than the law allows. So, so these are kind of the, all the variables that, that
that have to do with these inmate phone systems, and then there's tremendous pressure on jails to raise revenues to pay bills. Uh, and that's the other practical side we're talking about. It. But you mentioned one thing, and I'm not sure now is the time to bring it up, but, or, and Mr. Chairman, if we have a meeting dedicated to this, we can talk about them, but I think it's a big deal, and that's video visitation. Does that fall under the realm of, of this topic today? Okay. It well, absolutely that, does. Okay, well, thank you. Because you said something, Jason, that I, want, I, I think we need to be very aware of, and that is that the trend of going strictly to video visitation. And I have a disagreement with my local jailer over this because I, like you, think that we should, the rehabilitative value of someone being able to go and see their family physically is invaluable, and I think we need to protect that. It's all, and, and I see that being eroded. Um, uh, that doesn't mean we can't have visit video visitation, but if a family's local and can come visit, I think we need to protect that. And, and um, I know that there's, you know, it's, it's there's a convenience factor for jailers. There's a, you know, you're, you you have to move prisoners. All these things that you have to do. But we talk about rehabilitation. We talk about reform. And but then on the other hand, we're going to create a world where. Uh, a husband can't go see a wife or a wife can't go see a husband and visit in a local community, I, I think we really need to protect that. So I was glad to say that, that, that you agree with that because I know there's many people that don't and there's, there's tremendous financial pressure to go the other way with that. What say you? So on, on, I'm, my process of thinking on that is probably a little different than most of the jailers in the state. Um, and I would tell you that most of the jailers that have went to video visitation only are, are doing it mainly because of security issues. Uh, every jailer in the state can tell you horror stories of what's happened in their lobby or their visiting area. Well, sure, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll give you two real quick uh, stories that we dealt with here. One recently, um, this last fall, we had a lady from Louisville bring down enough fentanyl Unknowingly, she didn't know what it was, uh, and dropped it off in our lobby that would kill about 20 inmates. And we caught that, and we prosecuted that girl in federal court, and she's now a federal inmate in my female facility. So, you know, that that could have been, had we not caught that and kept that coming from into this facility, we definitely would have lost some lives in that. Um, and that kind of, that's kind of the, the things that we look at on the security side. We also had a lady come down. Uh, she was a care came in the door carrying a infant and had a son about probably three years old or four, maybe four walking next to her. Uh, she was the girlfriend of the inmate. When she walks in the door, she sees the inmate in the visiting booth with another girlfriend. So she turns and hands the baby off to a friend that came down with her to see somebody else and takes off running into the visiting booth, grabs the other girl by the hair of the head, drags her out into the lobby, and commences to, to giving her a, a beat down. And, you know, the, the other girl that holding the baby um, got into it also. Um, luckily, she didn't drop the baby. And the sad thing was the three-year-old boys were standing next to them, cheering them on. So, you know, that was a situation that took us a little while to get control of. I actually shut visiting down for the rest of the day because of that. And every jail in the state sees that. Um, you know, we also have problems on the on the inmate side where you might have uh, someone that's uh, on the same case and we're not aware of it and they get into it or they just don't like each other and they get into it or so-and-so's girlfriend's visiting another inmate and he doesn't know it until he shows up to the booth to see his mom and they get into it. So um, there's a lot of potential for things to go downhill fast in those settings. I appreciate that, uh, Jason. And I, I share your thought and, and uh, Senator Schickel's thoughts. I, I think uh, that that particular issue, safety, is certainly a concern. Um, and that's a perfectly valid reason uh, to move away from in-person visitation. But I think in-person visitation is better than, than video conferencing and telephone calls. Um, so I. I appreciate you commenting on that. I've gotten a slew of text messages uh, with follow-up comments and questions, some of which uh, are, we, 
we can't get into any more of those because we need to move on and representative uh, has a question so I'm going to let her ask and then we're going to go on to the next subject representative go ahead well actually um, some of what I was going to ask was also uh, addressed by the senator so thank you <laughs> that's okay um, but I, I I have spoken with one of the jailers in my district who is using this. Uh, I'm not sh sure that they've actually implemented it just yet, but they were going to move toward video visitation as a tool for people such as in my area in eastern Kentucky who may not have the money to come visit um, uh, inmates, that they can use this as a tool. Um, are you all, are you being encouraged to... Uh, use this video visitation exclusively or is it the option of the jailers? No, it's totally the option of the jailers and I, I just have not went down that a road. I'm not a big fan of, like I said before, of separating um, the family connection. I think that's a big part of the re rehabilitation side. Uh, we're real big on, on programs here in this jail and uh, I, I think that's just a a great tool that we need to keep. Now on the other side of it, we do have inmates that are three to four hours from home and family members just can't afford to come here. And you know, it would be a, a, a bonus for them to have that option. And that's See, what Casey, I would that, recommend. That makes perfect sense to me. I get that. Yeah. That, that's what I would recommend. If you're gonna go to, to video visitation, then I would keep the option for either or. But then some jails just can't do that. They don't have the facility to to uh, make both of those happen at the same time. So it's really it's really down to which facility can uh, can make it happen. Thank and you. Most Thank of them are financial. Most of them are financially strapped too. So you know that has to play a role too. Well, I appreciate your firsthand input. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Uh, some of the questions uh, Senator Webb uh, and I were thinking along the same lines, and I, I'll, I've already texted with uh, with the association to make sure. And I, I want to thank them. They actually reached out and offered and said, "Send any questions you have, we'll get an answer to you back uh, to the to the task force." So I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask about, and, and this will be one of the questions, but I'm curious to see what the cost is per inmate, the average cost per inmate, or how much money is spent per inmate to make those phone calls. Uh, how many jails are using that sort of system? How many jails have a video system if they are using one and what that cost is? And I might drag the vendors in here and ask some similar questions of them. Um, I, I'm still curious to know what the heck we're paying for I, and what kind of margin uh, is being seen there. I, I appreciate your candor in sharing the, the amount uh, of the cut of the, the cost that, that the jails are able to take from that. Uh, but I want to know... Uh, of the other 40 or 50 percent that the vendor's keeping, how much of that is is over and above um, what their costs are to operate the service? Because I don't understand where the where the cost is. It doesn't cost that much to have uh, to equip a jail with the hardware, uh, and online storage is not particularly expensive, especially if it's just audio. Uh, so I'm. I'm really curious about that. And I appreciate you helping us scratch the surface on it, but we do need to move on. One thing to remember real quick is yeah, that go ahead. Um, the jails, we're not required to provide a phone system. Right. Um, and that's kind of, you can see it as a privilege to the inmates. We are required to allow them sufficient phone calls to make bond and to make contact with their family, but that can be done with the, with the jail system, so the, the local uh, jail phones themselves which it would be difficult to manage that, but it can be done. Um, so it is a perk to be able to have those. That's a fair, videos. That, that's a completely fair point. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be some opportunity for the jails to earn revenue to help cover its costs or, or uh, to run the jail. Uh, but the constituents I've heard from, particularly the family members of people that are incarcerated, there's a bunch of those that can't afford to drop 15000 in their family member's uh, expense account there at the jail. And they go without contact with the outside world, and they're not particularly violent people. Uh, they're people who suffer because they don't have that contact. Because, as you mentioned, they, that rehabilitative 
uh, aspect of, of contact doesn't get to happen for them, uh, and it's cost prohibitive. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're going to move on to jail rating systems. Amanda Essex, you have been very patient waiting throughout the task force meeting so far. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Uh, are you in Colorado or in D.C.? I'm in Colorado. So you got an early start this morning. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and, uh, the floor is yours, Amanda. Go ahead. All right. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Amanda Essex, and I'm a senior policy specialist in the criminal justice program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'd like to start by thanking you for having me join you today. And if you'll give me just a moment, I'm going to see how I can get my screen going here. Oh, it looks like this might actually work quite well. Okay, are you seeing my slides? We are indeed. Excellent. Okay. There we go. For those who are not aware of NCSL, we are a nonprofit and bipartisan organization. We serve all 50 state legislatures, the commonwealths and territories, including all 7,383 legislators and over 25,000 legislative staff. We have offices in Denver and Washington, D.C., and we provide information and research on a wide range of policy issues, including sentencing and corrections. I'm going to start today with a brief overview of state regulation of local jails. And then I'm going to highlight a few examples of state jail rating systems and a few other models of oversight. And I'd like to begin with a really quick overview of the distinctions between prisons and jails. Uh, we find often laying that framework really useful for the conversations. In most states, prisons are under the purview of the state corrections department and jails are run by local sheriffs or local law enforcement. For the most part, jails are smaller facilities than prisons and they help people who have been convicted of lower level crimes or who are pretrial detainees. In most states, individuals convicted of a misdemeanor will be incarcerated in a local jail, and these are offenses typically carry under one year of incarceration. If someone is sentenced for more than a year, they'll typically serve that time in prison. In Iowa and Vermont, however, some misdemeanors can result in up to two years of incarceration in a jail. And then a few states have longer sentences for misdemeanors that can be served in prison rather than jail. For the most part, individuals convicted of a felony offense or sentenced to more than one year of incarceration will serve that time in prison. Another distinction between jails and prisons is that in almost every instance, anyone incarcerated in prison has been convicted of a crime, whereas many people held in jail are there pretrial waiting to be adjudicated. According to the Vera Institute of Justice, 62% of people in jails are there pretrial, having not yet been convicted of a crime. Given the fact that inmates are intended to have shorter lengths of stay, they often have more limited programming in jails, and prisons generally offer more robust programming for inmates, including treatment and educational opportunities. So in recent years, we've really seen some increased national attention when it comes to jails. A lot of this focus has followed efforts such as the MacArthur Foundation's Safety and Justice Challenge, which is focused on rethinking the use of jails and reducing the misuse and overuse of jails. And the Pew Charitable Trust Public Safety Performance Project provided technical assistance in Michigan just recently as the state developed a task force on jail and pretrial incarceration. Jail policy continues to emerge as an area of interest around the nation particularly with groups like MacArthur and Pew paying increased attention to the role of jails in the criminal justice system. In the last couple of years, one significant area of focus has been conditions of confinement in jails, and Kentucky was actually one of the first states to improve conditions for women in jails, and a number of states have followed suit since your state passed legislation co-sponsored by Chairman Westerfield in 2018. Most jails around the country are run by local law enforcement. Many of those jails house individuals who would otherwise be incarcerated by the state. I'd like to quickly apologize for my slightly outdated map here. As you can imagine, working from home, I haven't been able to get to our map making software. But if you imagine this updated for the Bureau of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics prisoners in 2018 report, um, the only differences you would see Michigan and North Dakota would be red indicating that there are no state inmates in local jails. And in 2018, there were 30 
states with prison inmates in their local jails. State inmates may be housed in jails for a number of reasons, and generally statutes lay the framework for who and under what circumstances prisoners can be held in jails and specify permissible daily reimbursement rates. Individuals in the custody of a state housed in local jails result in state reimbursement. This is one of the reasons that states have an interest in regulating jails. A report published in 2010, the National Association of Counties detailed these reimbursement rates around the country. On this slide, I've provided the state reimbursement rates for the state surrounding Kentucky, and the PowerPoint actually includes a link to this report. You can see rates range from $22 to $35, and medical expenses can be included in the daily rate. They may have a separate rate on top of the per diem, or the cost can be directly billed to the state. Contracts between corrections department and counties fill in the details. And while these rates are as of publication in 2010, many of them are set in statute, and so they don't change very often. Utah is one state that modified the reimbursement rate for jails in recent years. Um, the state passed legislation in 2016 that increased the reimbursement rate to, for jails that provide services, uh, treatment services specifically to inmates. This is similar to the approach of Kentucky of providing an additional $9 per day for jails that provide the same inpatient substance abuse treatment program that is provided in state prisons. A 2017 task force in the Colorado legislature looked at county jail funding and overcrowding and recommended doubling the state's reimbursement rate from $54 per inmate to nearly 109. Uh, that change was not put in place, but in legislation the following year, the state that in order to set the reimbursement rate, cities and counties have to report to the Joint Budget Committee on the average cost of confining individuals in local jails. This includes costs related to food, clothing and laundry, medical and behavioral health care, personnel, inmate training, vocational training, and education. With that con for the state regulation of jails, I'm going to dive into the examples I've been able to locate for state rating systems of jails. I'm going to start here with Ohio. Now, the state's administrative code sets out jail classifications. The information comes from the 2008 annual jail report from the Bureau of Adult Detention within the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. As you can see, the state has five categories of jails. The first category service jails, which are county and large city jail operations, allowing for the incarceration of individuals beyond 12 days, and these jails provide a full array of services. Minimum security jails are similar to these, but the only people in the facility are sent to traffic offenses, misdemeanors, low-level felonies, and they must be minimum risk offenders. 12-day and 12-hour jails are exactly what they sound like. In jails, the maximum incarceration is 12 consecutive days. These are mostly for smaller jurisdictions, providing a facility for booking and processing new arrests, and providing facility to incarcerate individuals for local ordinance violations. 12-hour jails only allow incarceration for 12 hours, and they're primarily just for booking and processing new arrests. And the final category here is the temporary holding facility which can only hold individuals for up to six hours. These aren't regulated in the same way as other jails, but are still established by the Bureau of Adult Detention. And this classification system in Ohio appears to be the most comparable to the system in Kentucky. Minnesota is another state with multiple classifications of correctional facilities, though not all of these classes would be considered jails. A class one facility holds inmates for no more than 72 hours. These are holding facilities. A uh, class two facility holds inmates before a court appearance and may hold for up to 90 days inmates who have been sentenced to incarceration. This is a lockup facility. Class three facility is a secure detention facility holding sentenced inmates as well as pretrial and pre-sentenced individuals. This is known as a jail facility. Class four is minimum security detention facility holding sentenced inmates as well as pretrial and pre-sentenced individuals. And this is a jail annex. And then a class five facility is a secure detention facility holding pretrial and pre-sentenced detainees known as an adult detention center. 
Uh, the state also has a class six facility, which is really comparable to a prison. So the following are a few examples from other states. Illinois set standards for county and municipal jails with more standards related to county jails as opposed to municipal. And municipal jails are only for temporary detention up to 48 hours in most instances, whereas county jails hold individuals serving terms of imprisonment and pretrial. In Arkansas, jails are delineated based on the form of government that runs the jails. So they have city, county, municipality, and public instrumentality jails. In my research, it's seen that this is most often the distinction that is used when laying out jail classifications. And Texas is unique in that it has both state and local jails. So misdemeanor offenses result in a sentence of up to one year in a local jail. However, the state has a classification of offenses known as a state jail felony. This is the lowest level of felony in the state, and it results in incarceration in a state jail for up to two years. Unlike jails in other states, these state jails don't hold individuals pretrial, instead only housing sentenced individuals. These next two slides come from annual evaluations of state prisons conducted by the Ohio Correctional Institutional Inspection Committee and reported to the legislature. But there don't really seem to be comparable rating systems like this at the state level for jails that I've been able to locate. So I'm using this example from prison facilities. You can see on this slide, facilities are evaluated based on five categories. The first category of safety and security includes use of force, control of illegal substances, and security management, among other factors. Uh, within the second category of health and well being is unit conditions and services provided to incarcerated individuals. The third category for fair treatment includes staff and inmate interactions, inmate grievance, and inmate discipline. Rehabilitation and reentry is the fourth category. And this includes planning for reentry as well as programming available for incarcerated individuals. And the final category is fiscal accountability. On this slide, you can actually see uh, the rating scales used in the evaluations as well as the ratings for two facilities from the most recent evaluation. You can see facilities are rated within each category as either exceptional, good, acceptable, or in need of improvement. And the full report includes ratings for 28 uh, prison facilities in the state. Another approach to state oversight of jails has come in the form of oversight bodies established in statute. In Connecticut, there's the Criminal Justice Policy Advisory Commission, which develops and recommends policies to prevent prison and jail overcrowding and gathers data regarding the impacts of efforts to prevent the Tennessee Corrections Institute establishes minimum standards for jails, establishes guidelines for security at those facilities, and inspects them. Some of these duties are similar to those statutorily required by the Department of Corrections in Kentucky as they relate to jails that house state prisoners, including developing standards for jails. Finally, I'd like to wrap up with one other model of state oversight for jails. In the vast majority of states, including Kentucky, the state corrections department has jurisdiction over state prisons. However, there are seven states with what's known as a unified correction system. In these states, which are Alaska, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Vermont, and West Virginia, the corrections department is not only responsible for prisons, but also for jails. West Virginia actually only recently changed to a unified system in 2018. So with that, I'd like to thank you again. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, you answered one, the score there in, uh, I don't have the presentation in front of me, but the scoring, I was wondering if it was numeric, or but I see that it was good, better, best, or needs improvement, what have you. Um, are there penalties uh, or incentives for facilities that excel or fail to excel under the standards in that state or any other state? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. I don't know off the top of my head, but I will certainly be happy to get that information here. <clears throat> Anybody else have our Chairman Meredith? Amanda, on one of the slides, there was mention 
of Texas having county jails and state jails. Could you explain yes, that a little bit? Because I assume they have state prisons as well. That is correct, yes. Uh, happy to provide a little more distinction there, uh, Mr. Chairman. The state jails are similar to the county jails, except they are run by the state. I think in general, they're smaller facilities, uh, but they fall under the corrections department along with prisons. And those are for a very narrow category of offenses, whereas the county jails are more comparable to jails around the country. Do you know what any of those offenses are by any chance? Or could you get that for us? I can certainly get that for you. Uh, we do have some of that compiled. I unfortunately just don't have it right in front of me. Thank you. Amanda, this Absolutely. is uh, Whitney again. Do you know what the makeup is of the uh, of the various uh, councils, committees, or, or um, they all had different names and acronyms there. For the, each state has a different group uh, or board or committee or council that makes these assessments or reviews the facilities. Do you have an idea of what who makes up those? Like what positions, what stakeholder groups are involved? Are they all corrections? Do they have Civilians? Do they have? Who who sits on these groups? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that these groups include a wide range of members. Uh, many of them include lawmakers. Uh, they include individuals from the corrections department. They will often include um, other law enforcement ind individuals from law enforcement attorneys. Um, I believe that we have a resource that lays out some of the particulars, and so we'll be happy to send that along as well. Please do. Uh, do you know if any of these groups have authority to, to impose anything on the jails that they're scoring? Do they make, or do they simply more passively make recommendations to the legislature or to the executive branch to do something or to whomever, the Department of Corrections, whatever? My sense from the statutes and from reading that information, it's often based on recommendations, although I will certainly do some digging to see if they have more direct action that they're able to take as well. All right. Any other questions, members? I don't see any in the chat. I didn't get a text message from anybody. Hold on. Oh, just the judge texting in. All right. Seeing no further questions, Amanda, thank you. Thanks for being patient and waiting until uh, I can call on you. And I hope the weather's good in Colorado and you and, and your family and your fellow NCSL uh, colleagues and friends of mine are all doing well and healthy over there. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Take care, Amanda. You too. All right. Next up. We have uh, Lisa Lamb, who I know is, there she is, uh, hearing remotely. Lisa, good to see you this morning still. Uh, appreciate you coming on to, to give an update on uh, halfway houses and, and private prisons. And if you don't mind, uh, I was going to ask, but you can throw it in uh, however you'd like, and, and members feel free to follow up with any questions you have. But you may give us an update on the department's COVID response and how things are going, what the status is right now uh, with regard to COVID-19 uh, in the facilities around the state. Lisa, you have the floor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you hear me, sir? It's a little soft. Uh, okay. Can you move that closer? Sorry about that. Okay. Is that any better? Slightly. Okay. All right, I'll try and talk loud. Is that there we better? Go. There we go. That's, that's better. Okay. I feel like I'm screaming, so I apologize for that. But thank you for having me, Chairman Westerfeld and Chairman Meredith. My name is Lisa Lamb, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Community Services and Local Facilities. I uh, still kind of struggle saying that because it's brand new. I've been in the role about six weeks. So if there's something I don't know, uh, please rest assured I will get that information for you. So you ask us to talk to you today about how the Department of Corrections uses halfway houses and um, the private prisons. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's all trying to. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. So I thought I'd start out first on the private prison because we only have one, and that is located in Babyville. It's a Lee Adjustment Center. It's a medium custody male prison, and the current population is 778. Uh, that contract was entered into in 2017. Oh, I went too far. Oops. Forgive me. Can you just do that again? Then? Sorry. Okay. Then the other thing that I wanted to tell you all about, and uh, Representative uh, Tackett Lafferty brought this up, is a new estate prison, mm -hmm. and that is Southeast State Correctional Complex. That is in Wilrock, Kentucky. We are going to open that this fall, and it will hold um, 665 inmates. We are in the hiring process now. So far, we have hired seven, um, 74 correctional officers, and we have a warden on the ground, and the basic academy is underway now. And this is just a map to show you all of their facilities and showing you the new one, uh, Southeast State Correctional Complex in Green. So reentry service centers, uh, they're formerly called halfway houses. The contract was revised in 2019, and they are required now to offer evidence-based reentry programming. And as a result of that requirement, the per diem was increased by $2. Some of the programs that they offer include moral recognition therapy, new directions, and 24-7 dads. And just to give you an idea of the budget, we paid reentry service centers $19.5 million in FY20. There are currently 22 reentry service centers located across the state. This includes seven in Fayette County and 11 in Jefferson County. And here's a map showing you where those are located. We have one in Pike County, one in Madison County, one in Davies County, and one in McCracken County. So how the department uses these, these are multi-use contract facilities and they're used for three purposes. First is a housing option for community custody inmates. And it's important to note that not all community custody inmates qualify to be housed in a reentry service center. Placement is affected by KRS 532-100. The majority of community custody inmates are housed in a county jail because of the statute. They also must be within 24 months of parole eligibility or minimum expiration of sentence, and they can't have any pending disciplinary violations, and they uh, can't be enrolled in evidence-based programming because we don't want to interrupt that programming. We also use them as traditional uh, transitional housing for parolees. This could be very short-term. It could be a matter of days for an immediate release or a period of months while the individual obtains a more permanent home placement. We also use these centers for treatment. We offer substance abuse programming in 12 of the reentry service centers. Inmates who are placed at them for treatment are clinically assessed for appropriate level of care, and they can also be placed into treatment from either the parole board, court, or by social service clinicians who work hand in hand with their probation or parole officers. These clinicians also refer those that are on uh, HIP or home incarceration. This gives you an idea of where the substance abuse programming um, is at the reentry service centers and also the supervision time. COVID-19 has affected the population of all the facilities in the state, primarily due to you had the closure of the court, but then also because we suspended transfers uh, and also suspended controlled intake. We house inmates at the lowest custody level possible within statutory framework. We have a population management division that reviews the list of community custody inmates on a weekly basis. And just for an example of this, when I put together this presentation, there were only 48 inmates who qualified 
for housing in a reentry service center based on the statutory criteria. This week, that's more like 55. So you asked me to give you an update on where we are right now with COVID-19 in our facility. We've worked diligently, doesn't even really, is a solely word I can think of, but it has been our primary focus to try and protect our incarcerated population and our staff. We put together some steps at the very beginning, even before the first case, uh, in Kentucky, and several of these proactive steps we're still doing. Uh, the governor suspended visitation on March 11th, less than a week after the first positive case in Kentucky, and that suspension still is in effect. We implemented a screening process for anyone entering a prison. This is staff or anyone else. They're checked for symptoms, including fever. We initiated enhanced sanitization efforts using germicide and a bleach solution. And we also did something that I'd never heard of before. We put in foot sanitation trays throughout our prison. These are uh, literally something that the staff step into as they walk into the facility and then also each door. We stopped all inmate transfers department-wide. This is intake between institutions, between institutions and jails, uh, unless it's for a medical or security emergency. To date, we've had large outbreaks of the virus at three prisons and positive cases in five others. Our first prison where we had the outbreak was Green River Correctional Complex. We did mass testing at the prison and ended up with a total of 367 positive inmates and 51 positive staff and tragically three deaths at that prison. The virus next hit Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women in Pee Wee Valley. We had a total of 31 staff there and 236 inmates test positive. The next large outbreak occurred at the Kentucky State Reformatory. We currently have 18 staff and 190 inmate cases. And unfortunately, again, this shows you how fast it changes. Just this morning, we had our sixth death due to COVID-19 at KSR. Our most recent outbreak is at North Point Training Center, where we've had 10 staff and 16 inmate positive cases so far. With each positive case, staff or inmates, we do contact tracing immediately, and then we work with the Department for Public Health to, term, to determine next steps. We have a uh, section on our website that is devoted to COVID cases and we keep that updated each day and update it at around 6 p.m. each evening. This is a chart that obviously, like I said, with the two additional deaths at KSR, it's already a little bit updated, but it shows you that we had 122 staff cases, 811 inmates, and again, this total now is 10 deaths. So another important thing to know, though, is that we are seeing inmates and staff recover. So right now we have 379 active inmate cases and 53 active staff cases. So that translates into 432 inmates have recovered from this virus and 69 staff have recovered. So you can stop sharing my screen if you will. So that was it for my presentation for you all. Um, we were also sent some questions, and would you like for me to touch on those now? I would. You don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Certainly. Some of those, about half of what you said, were covered in the presentation, but the ones that were not, we were asked to explain problems that are sent to reentry service centers via public transportation or by family members, how is that safer than control transfer of state inmates? What we'd like to point out is that going to a reentry service center, we believe is the first step to reintegrate re that uh, individual into the community. But we welcome any time we have a family member who is willing to do that. We have explored trying to come up with some kind of uh, mechanism where the department would transfer 
But to be honest, it hasn't been um, economically feasible for us to do that. It's just, it's just been cost prohibitive. So the second question was, are Crowley home placements being investigated only by phone, no on-site visits? So due to offend to officer, our probation and parole officer safety during this pandemic, we have modified our normal procedure. And normally that would entail an in-home visit by a PNP officer. So currently it's a combination. They first confirm that the address exists. If it's a residence that has never been used before by the parolee, this may entail the officer doing a drive-by of that residence looking at Google Earth to investigate the location and neighborhood. This is all in addition to calling and speaking with the person that the individual has provided as their home placement. The next question was uh, rather long, but it involved uh, reentry service centers being allowed to collect 25% of parolees' earnings. And uh, due to the fact that they, are, they receive a lower per diem for parolees, and it asked us if we thought that this created an uh, increase in recidivism or financial problems. So first of all, let me say the Department of Corrections absolutely understands the financial burden that this pandemic has caused on the owners of the reentry service centers. They are businesses, and I know that they're negatively impact just like other businesses in this state. We can't find, though, where we ever did a directive to stop parolees from going out and working. What we saw instead were halfway uh, reentry service centers, excuse me, directors telling us that they weren't going to allow that for the safety of the rest of the clients in their facilities. So they, they communicated to us that they were stopping this practice. Uh, and they also were aware of the fact that many of the places of employment that parolees typically worked were closed at the outset of the pandemic. They're sharing with us now that in most cases the parolees are going back out to work. You ask what directives uh, and information had been given to the reentry service center since the beginning of the pandemic. We have an individual who, whose primary job is to work with the directors of these facilities. And he communicates with them sometimes daily, but on a regular basis. So we asked them uh, for their pandemic action plan initially so we could work with the facilities to ensure that they were safe and that they were implementing some of the same things that we were doing in our institution. And then the last question that uh, you provided to us, Chairman Westerfield, was, is it true that state inmates are being held from reentry service centers in order to transfer to the new Southeast Correctional Complex. This is absolutely not true because that is going to be a prison for medium custody uh, male inmates. So I'll be glad to do my best to answer any questions that you all have. Thank you very much, Chairman Meredith. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you mentioned on the reentry service centers, there are 22 of those, correct? currently? Yes, sir. And 12 that have some sort of treatment programs for, for substance abuse? That's correct. The, the gap of the 10 that do not, do they just not have the ability? Is there not a need for that? Is that something we need to upscale to try to get that more, more appropriate across the entire 22? Or what's the situation there? I will check on that, sir, and see if that has been something that um, we felt like they didn't have the treatment space for, or uh, I know that when we changed the contract last year and asked them to provide reentry programming, that, that if they had a treatment program for substance abuse, that counted as one of their, uh, as one of their reentry programs, but I will check on that for you. Okay. One other real quick question, just looking at the map on the reentry service centers, um, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but it appeared to me, yeah, that kind of the entire south central part of the state, there's not anything there. And so I wanted to mention that from a regional standpoint, and, you know, obviously inmates trying to get back to where their home areas they might have come from, that looks like it could be a challenge into getting them back into the workforce through a reentry center and then back into their home areas to continue those, those jobs. 
Uh, so I wanted to mention that real quick. That is absolutely correct. When you look at that map, it is glaringly apparent that there are none in the south central part of the state. Is there any efforts being made to try to bring something on there or get something going somewhere in that area to, to try to rectify that? Well, where they are contract facilities, we do have a process where, you know, typically organizations, individuals, companies, they contact us and express an interest to have that. And to my knowledge, you know, we don't have any from that area that have contacted us. Is let me ask one more question following up on that issue. Is there a possibility of trying to get some sort of an RFP out for something specifically in that area because of the, the, the issue there? I will absolutely check on that for you, sir, and get back to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Lisa. We got a question from Senator Carroll. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. Fire away, sir. Yeah, Deputy Commissioner, uh, one of the main concerns that, that I have, and uh, my district uh, covers Paducah with Keaton, and uh, there is concern related to their census, and, and I understand it's not only their facility, but the other facilities throughout the state, and concerns that with their low numbers, that they're not able to sustain their operations over a long uh, period. And if that could be the case and some of these places are cutting down, what are the long-term ramifications? Senator Carroll, we absolutely do understand that and you are correct that it is affecting all of these facilities. It's affecting really everywhere in the state. This pandemic has caused uh, us to take actions that, again, we don't like in the terms of uh, the, the uh, burden that it's created for facilities, but we did make those difficult choices to try and protect our incarcerated population and the staff at these facilities, but you are correct. It is creating a burden, and we are aware of that. How much will the uh, the release of, and I, I guess with the next round that they're that the governor's looking at of over two thousand inmates, uh, how much will that impact uh, these these facilities? I have not heard that number, Senator Carroll. Two thousand. Uh, I had heard um, a much smaller number, but as far as the specific impact, we won't be able to say that until we've actually identified those individuals that would meet that criteria that the governor established previously. And, and I was thinking, we, we've already released approximately 1,000, is that correct? Yes, it was uh, the last time I checked, and it does change, because one of the requirements was that the individual needed to have a verified home placement. So at the initial outset, when the uh, commutations were put into effect, some did not, but that has fluctuated as some uh, were able to provide that. But the last time I checked, there were uh, a little over 1,100 that were released. Okay, and I was looking at those, and I, I understand there are about six or 700 more that are under review now. Yes, that is the number that I had heard. Okay, well that's, I was getting giving a, a total. I apologize okay. for not being okay. clear. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Lisa, thank you uh, for your testimony, and I appreciate you answering those questions. Um, and uh, in light of the subject matter of this task force, we're likely to have DOC come back a time or two. Um, so I appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters today uh, for making time. Uh, we've gone a little over on our time, but that's okay because uh, this is important work. I want to do a reminder, make a reminder here here at the end of the meeting. So I hope anybody hasn't jumped off the call yet. If there are any folks uh, who need to answer the role but haven't and or missed the role that Yvonne, Yvonne made at the top of the meeting, um, let us know. Uh, are there any? Hit the chat. Yeah, speak up. Commissioner. Commissioner Cruz, I didn't have audio at first. We got you now. Okay, thanks. 
saw Secretary Noble in the meeting as well. Uh, I know Senator Webb uh, has, has been in here and she's. Uh, I'm here. There she is. <laughs> she's home office. Uh, Secretary Noble was in the group. Any Anybody else? And I don't have the Blue Jeans app right pulled up in front of me at this moment. All right. The boss says that's everyone. Uh, with that, uh, we conclude our first meeting. And uh, our next meeting will be when? Do we, I, we do know, but I can't. August 21st, another Friday, I believe. Um, Chairman, you have anything else? We are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.